Hello Planeswalkers, Tyler here, and today on Taste the Cardboard, we're going to be stepping back and taking a look, both flavorfully and mechanically, at my personal favorite plane in the entirety of Magic's lore, that being the gothic horror-inspired homeland of Soren Markov. That's right, today we're taking a deep dive into Innistrad, a world of zombies and werewolves and ghosts, a land protected by literal guardian angels, and eventually ransacked by a horrible jellyfish from beyond the stars. But we'll get there in time. For now, let's look at what Innistrad is, how it was designed, and how that design influenced the flavor. Innistrad was first introduced in the first set released in Innistrad Block on September 30th, 2011. It was followed by Dark Ascension, then Avacyn Restored, which both came out in 2012. We would then later see the plane again in 2016 with Shadows Over Innistrad and Eldritch Moon, continuing the story from Battle for Zendikar with the adventures of the Gatewatch. Innistrad itself is a world based on 18th and 19th century gothic horror of America and Western Europe. A world populated by humans that just want to live their lives, the plane also plays host to a menagerie of horrifying creature tribes, namely vampires, werewolves, zombies, spirits, and even demons. The birthplace of the ancient vampiric planeswalker Soren Markov, life on Innistrad is a constant struggle to survive, as any minute a life can be cut tragically short by a single careless trek through the woods or an unguarded stroll through a silent graveyard. A set design from the top down, meaning that flavor came first and mechanics were implemented to fit the flavor, Innistrad was set to be a deeply flavored experience from the get-go. A solid example can be seen in the design of the two-sided flip cards. While the idea of cards transforming has been around since Kamigawa block, Innistrad was the first to implement the idea of cards having a different card back rather than a default, allowing them to have what was referred to as a day and a night side. While not strictly limited to them, the creature tribe that benefited the most from this mechanic were the werewolves. As tradition goes, a werewolf is a human by day and a vicious wolf beast by the light of the full moon. With the design of the two-sided cards, werewolves were able to achieve just that. For example, let's take a look at the Gatsaf Shepherd. On his day side, he appears to be an unassuming man, maybe in his mid to late 30s, overseeing his flock of sheep. No keyword abilities, no amazing stats, this is your friend Bill that you'll meet at the tavern after a long day of tending the fields for a few drinks and stories about how one of his flock mysteriously went missing, or how you lost your good axe in the head of a risen ghoul. Standard day to day fare. However, on his night side, he flips over into the Gatsaf Howler, a beefier, scarier beast that comes with Intimidate, as well as the source of Bill's missing sheep from earlier. What I like most about these cards, compared to their Kamigawa cousins, is that, since the werewolf art's on the back, it's easy to forget that the unimpressive human sitting on the board is hiding a dark secret. The Kamigawa cards are both creatures on the front, so everyone is always aware of the legend that your basic creature will eventually become. But since all the werewolves have the same effect that causes them to flip, you can be facing down a bunch of average humans one minute only to be put onto the back foot when they all change at the same time into monstrous killers. Werewolves weren't the only tribe to get a flavorful out of the park knockout though. Spirits were another of the primary tribes of Innistrad that saw major support, and though they didn't get a personal mechanic like the werewolves did, they were still able to bring their own story flair to the table in a much different way. See on Innistrad, not all ghosts are malevolent forces. Take for example, the Geist of St. Traft. A nobleman in life who continued to be protected by angels even in death, he served a vital role in helping Thalia overcome the dark influence of Emmercool during Shadow's Block. He, alongside other spirits, such as the Dearly Departed, represent loved ones lost, who help empower those living with their presence. At the other end of the spectrum, however, we get cards like Grasp of Phantoms or Sturmgeist, dark spirits more akin to creatures that go bump in the night or restless specters never laid to rest properly. Ghost stories are very real on the plane of Innistrad, and we're seeing these concepts play out before us in incredibly flavorful ways. And since we've already covered two of the primary tribes represented on Innistrad, we'd be remiss to not cover vampires as well. Born of a pact forged by Soren Markov's own grandfather Edgar long ago, the vampires of Innistrad serve a very traditional role to what we in the real world perceive of when we think of these bloodsuckers. Elegantly dressed, powerful, feeding off of a human populace from the shadows, these vampires feel like vampires. But that's not to say that the vampires from Matrix's other planes don't feel like true vampires. 
as every plane that they appear on has their own unique take. Tarkir vampires don't feel like Zendikar vampires, who in turn feel nothing like Innistrad vampires, and so on and so forth. But Innistrad is where we really get a feel for the traditional take on these monsters. Just look at cards like Screeching Bat and Elusive Tormentor, who both play into the theme of vampires transforming into either bats or mist, or the Chosen of Markov, a young human girl willingly giving herself to the vampires. We've also got characters like Olivia Valderin, whose abilities are so flavorful for vampires, you can almost taste the blood on your own lips. By dealing a single damage to a creature to change it into a vampire, she's taking a metaphorical bite at their neck. If they're weak, such as having one toughness, they die. But if they're strong enough to survive her bite and turn, she can take control of them as their vampire sire. And on the topic of the undead, zombies are another thing that Innistrad brings to the table with an amazing amount of flair and oddly different playstyles. Zombies are given to both blue and black, with each color handling them vastly differently, yet still within the scope of what we know zombies to be. Black is the more traditional route, with creatures like Gravecrawler and enchantments like Endless Ranks of the Dead showcasing the terrifying idea of an undying zombie horde that continues to come back over and over and over again. Army of the Damned and From Under the Floorboards further strengthen this connection, both in artwork and in effect. Meanwhile, Blue handles things in a more Frankenstein's monster sort of way, creating scobs who are more stitched together from bodies in the graveyard. We even have Rooftop Storm, a card that depicts the same iconic IT'S ALIVE scene from Frankenstein. And it all makes sense. Blue is the color of knowledge, of learning so it fits perfectly that the scientists making these monstrosities would be aligned with blue. They're learning, they're building upon what they know, until they get from a screeching scob up to Garolf's masterpiece. The last tribe that I wanted to touch on is angels. In a world of bloodthirsty vampires, feral werewolves, spooky spirits, and ravenous undead, the humans of Innistrad don't stand much of a chance, or at least that's what Soren Markov thought. Seeing humans as a means of keeping his own race from devolving into cannibalism, Soren saw fit to create Avacyn, a literal guardian angel for the humans to rally around, and rally around her they did. Bolstering themselves behind the church of Avacyn, we see creatures like the Angelic Overseer or Angel of Glory's Rise, beings of pure light and justice that are here to chase out the darkness, literally in the case of Angel of Glory's Rise. Much as it does with werewolves, zombies, vampires, and spirits, Innistrad brings angels into their most core and basic form. Guardians and protectors that are here to keep you safe from shadows in the corners and the boogeyman that's under your bed. At its core, I think that's what makes Innistrad such an amazingly flavorful plane. It keeps things basic, and that's great. Magic's multiverse is filled with so many distinct, fantastic worlds, places where creatures and concepts that we know and love can be explored in a variety of different ways. Ixalan brought us Spanish conquistador vampires, Zendikar gave us militaristic battle angels, Ravnica introduced sentient zombies living their lives in the Undercity, and Kamigawa blessed us with spirits that are more akin to representations of the world or of emotions or feelings. I'm not saying that these are bad by any stretch, quite the opposite. But these creatures all have their own stories to tell that we've never really been exposed to before. Innistrad, however, builds upon the common knowledge that we share with these creatures and ideas giving us all a common ground for what we can expect. We've seen zombie movies, we know Dracula, ghost stories are a time-honored tradition, and the legend of the werewolf is universally understood. And the fact that Innistrad took these ideas and formed mechanics around them, rather than the other way around, makes them feel much more organic and real. I could honestly go into every single tiny facet of Innistrad, and perhaps in future videos, I will. I want to look more in depth at each creature tribe, as well as look at the locations, stories, and spells that Innistrad has used to convey the feelings that the plane brings up. If you'd like to hear more about it in future episodes of Taste the Cardboard, be sure to let me know down in the comment section below. Make sure to leave a like, toss a sub our way, and ring that little bell so that you never miss an upload. Later planeswalkers.